A very warm welcome to the final edition of the Cricket Library podcast for 2019. What a wonderful year it has been hanging out with you all and chatting to some of the magnificent guests we've had, really. It's been a real pleasure to chat all things cricket with so many wonderful people throughout the year and we're finishing with a bang. We are going to finish with someone who represented New Zealand on 26 occasions in Test Match Cricket, claiming 77 wickets with a best bowling of 6 for 54. 94 one-day internationals in there as well, best bowling 4 for 24, 110 wickets to his name, 3 T20 internationals as well. All three formats played three World Cups, was part of three World Cup campaigns for New Zealand. Uh, An absolute gentleman, a wonderful person to talk to. His name is Daryl Tuffy, and I'm really looking forward to chatting through with him about his journey into first-class cricket. He debuted fairly young for a fast bowler on the first-class scene back in 96, 97. Uh, Talk about some of the the players he had the pleasure of playing with here, a bit about Stephen Fleming's captaincy. Uh, Also hear about some of the the challenges of bowling on difficult wickets and we bring in a new question at the end of the podcast today as well asking him about the three people he'd most like to have a net with and I'm really looking forward to finding out who those three people will be we're going to make that a, a standard finishing question on the podcast in the coming season ahead but right now it's time to get yourself comfortable Sit back, relax, and enjoy because in just a few moments, we'll be chatting with our final guest of the year, Mr. Daryl Tuffy. Enjoy. And it's a very warm welcome on the Cricket Library podcast to Daryl Tuffy. Hey, how you going? Yeah, very well. Thank you for joining us on the program. It's always good to have guests that have played at the international level and with Australia playing New Zealand at the moment, it's quite a good fit having a former New Zealand international on the show. So we'll, we might start off with where your passion for cricket began, where, where your journey uh, playing cricket began back in New Zealand growing up there. I'm from um, Auckland, so I'm from the main the main city uh, in New Zealand, or the biggest city. Um, got to grow up um, in the southern part of Auckland, uh, probably probably a rugby league and rugby uh, union um, kind of area, but um, I always gravitated towards cricket as a, as a youngster. So I started at about 47, eight years old, I think, from memory, and I've always enjoyed just throwing balls, hitting balls, and um, any kind of, kind of ball game, really. But um, I mainly played, obviously, cricket in the summer, and... Um, play rugby league in the winter. But uh, as I kind of went on, um, as probably about 13, 14, then things started to get a bit more serious and started to make a few more representative teams. And by the time I was 18, then I was on a New Zealand youth team and um, knocking on the door of uh, first class cricket and I kind of went from there. And was it hard to make a decision between playing rugby league and cricket? Was there a point there where you had to had to kind of break the – the, the tie to rugby league and, and go all out for cricket around that 15, 16 age mark? Yeah, it was probably about 16 to 17. Like, um, I think around 17, I actually went and um, went over to England and to play cricket. So that was probably my first winter away from home. Um, so I went, I had the summer over in England and uh, playing cricket. And kind of from then on, never looked back. I was kind of going backwards and forwards, playing a bit of uh, club cricket every winter. I'd kind of leave around April, play um, April to September, come home, get back into our cricket season, obviously run parallel to Australia. Um, I kind of did that for about three or four years and, and then kind of first, then made it into first class cricket. So it was around 17 where um, I was, I probably enjoyed cricket more than I enjoyed um, playing rugby league. And to be fair, I was, I was better at cricket. <laughs> <laughs> and- so it was, it, was, it, was easy, it was an easy decision. <laughs> oh, very good. And, and, and what, was the, what was the transition like moving into first-class cricket? You're r- relatively young 
playing first class cricket that 90, 96, 97 season, you would have been about nine, 18, 19 around that time. Uh, Correct, yeah. F- for, for a young a young guy, fast bowler, um, moving in to that environment, what what was that like? It was pretty daunting at the time. Like I'd, um, I'd played New, the New Zealand youth team um, and a couple of our guys had played. Uh, Daniel Vittori, he'd played, um, he actually just made his uh, international debut that, that year um, in that 90, kind of 96, 97 season. Um, he played against England. Um, so we grew up playing together in the same the same province or same state back home. And so we were just playing like the youth the youth team there. And um, I just got invited down to go as net bowler. They, uh, they were playing in Auckland and they oh, I had a bit of time time off. And they said, "Look, would you like to come down and, and have a bowl with um, the first class team?" And I jumped at the chance there to go, and um, subsequently bowled pretty well to, um, to the majority of players I didn't even know. I knew of them, but didn't know them personally. And um, yeah, probably about two, three weeks later, I was um, with a couple of guys going up to play first class, uh, play national cricket. Or Dan, I got my opportunity to go and play first class cricket, which was really good. I played the last couple of games of the ninety six, ninety seven team. And you have a couple of seasons playing first class cricket, uh, applying your craft, learning your game. Uh, then the call up comes in two thousand to make your test debut at Hamilton. How was how was the lead up to that playing playing your first test match? Once again, it's pretty daunting. Obviously, going back up, but it's exactly the same as first class cricket. We're going up to a team where. Um, They'd been struggling against Australia. Australia had come out and um, I'd played them in a warm-up game. Our first-class team played a, um, a tour match against um, Australia and I bowled pretty well in that game and um, I was having a pretty good season but first-class cricket but never thought I was likely of, um, of playing for New Zealand. I thought I still caught a bit away from that. And um, But, um, yeah, they just wanted to make a change for the last test match, which was in Hamilton, and um, myself and another young guy and out my team, he was been of those, Bruce Martin. Both of us got called into the squad and she was a bit green. So then I got the um, the tap on the shoulder saying that you're going to make the test debut. So pretty, uh, that was very surreal um, playing that. It kind of went, it was a bit of a blur, really, the whole game. We, we lost that game, but I had, you know, it was good fun playing against Australia and guys like him. So you'd see, been playing um, day in, day out. Like Ashton Sears, like Glenn McGrath, Steve Ball and Mark War were playing then. Yeah, really the cream of the crop of Australian cricket at, at that era was um, some phenomenal players in that Australian team. And um, stepping up to that level, what what's the what's the advice you'd give to, to young guys coming through to prepare for that? Is there any way you can prepare or is it something that you just learn uh, as you go? Yeah, I think the thing is that you learn how to go. I don't think you're ever kind of prepared like – I mean, when anyone does get caught, whether you're probably an 18 or 20 year old, or whether you're probably you know 27, 30, a bit more like a senior, um, debutante. Um, my debut was 21. Um, didn't really know a lot. Really didn't know anything about playing Test cricket. Um, it was so so far so much different than playing first class. And so I was kind of comfortable in the first class arena by then. I played about three years and done okay. Some good results, mixed results. But then when you Jump up into test cricket against the best side in the world. That was just a um, felt like a bit of a cauldron, and one I always cherished. Like I didn't play very well in that game, but I certainly um, it couldn't get any tougher than than that. And that was probably the thing I took away from that the most. Um, this is the toughest it's ever going to get. So it can only get easier than that from from here on in. So, and uh, I subsequently went away on a winter tour. Uh, we went away for about four months to. Um, Kenya, Zimbabwe, uh, Australia, Sri Lanka, um, sorry, Singapore, and yeah. South Africa. So that was uh, that was a, a big four months uh, heading away. But that was that was an enjoyable tour. And you, you mentioned Zimbabwe there. That's where you made your one day international debut. What was it like travelling over there? Teams don't get to go there very much anymore. And um, w- was it a, a, an unsettled time in Zimbabwe, or was it a, was it a happier time over there? I think it was just starting to turn, like, probably for the worst, really. Like, um, there's a lot of political stuff. I was kind of, like, pretty young and naive and didn't really know what was going on. I was just a young 21-year-old kind of on tour and just, you know, trying to play. We had a very good team at that stage. Like, I was one of the junior members and 
I had our bowling attack was like, uh, Chris Cairns, Shane O'Connor, um, Dion Nash. So those were three guys that had played international cricket for the last five, three years or so. And so I was kind of on the tour as a, as a, as a youngster to kind of watch and learn and, and obviously have given an opportunity to, um, to help the team, team win. So I didn't play any of the test matches there, but I managed to play, um, in a uh, couple of one days there and then I played a couple of test matches in South Africa towards the end of that um, that tour. And playing under Stephen Fleming, the the most celebrated New Zealand captain of all time, how did you find his leadership and um, what would you say were attributes that he brought uh, that helped your game? You know, he was, he was great. Like, um, probably the confidence to, um, A, firstly, to pick me out of kind of um, just, you know, out of first class cricket, but obviously to give me opportunities um, uh, when when needed. Like um, obviously, as I mentioned before, we had a very good um, bowling line up there that we, that we took away, and so I was kind of always on the periphery, like whether I was going to play or not. But um, every chance I got, he obviously got me into the team at some warm up games and um, threw me the ball at every opportunity. So, and obviously, I I under even for most of my career, and um, which is really enjoyable. I think he was a great captain. Um, and he started to obviously really convert like his 50s into 100s, and I was very lucky enough to, to play alongside him when uh, he actually probably was at the peak of his game, um, which was great. You know, he was leading us and, um, and scoring runs, so it was good to see. And, and he's known uh, for his skills as a tactician um did you find that helped with your bowling as well with setting fields and uh game plans to dismiss batsmen was he a bit of a, a thinking captain yeah definitely like um we did a lot of um research into opposition i think it's just like common from a common knowledge now like all most teams do that like um it's, you know most teams got a bowling coach now and um a batting advisor and they're always working out plans and um yeah, kind of around that 2000 mark, we certainly started to, uh, to read dig deep into um, how we can get guys out and um, certain fields we can do, uh, like we can we can kind of um, set to get guys up. You're, you're seeing like at the moment with um, the guys bowling short at Stephen Smith at the moment, just waiting, just waiting patiently for him to hit one to one of the fielders, and at the moment it's working. And you know, Steve's a great batter, and he's going to have to you know combat that, um, which I, you know, I'm sure he will, but. We were always thinking of like little things like that, how we can get certain guys out um, right from the from the start. Oh, just just on the Stephen Smith thing, um, Wagner and his bowling in the current series. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, fantastic. Um, I played a lot of cricket against uh, Neil Wagner. He played for one of the other states called uh, Otago, which is way down the deep south, and um, played a lot against Neil before I moved across to Australia and just to see him. He's, he's a great bloke and. To see him kind of, he was quickest, well, or the quickest left arm to get 200 test wickets. And um, to watch, I went down over the last couple of days to um, the Boxing Day test, and I saw just the way he ran, ran in all day and the bowl into the wicket, like six to ten bounces. It was unbelievable. And just the, um, yeah, it's, it's been great to see. And, and he's getting rewards at the moment, too. And, um, yeah, to have that fitness just to keep coming in, ball after ball, bowling short. And I'll, he, I think he bowled 60% bounces. Um, <laughs> I think in that, that first innings, I would have bowled like six bounces. <laughs> <laughs> if I was bowling there, and four of those would have gone for four. <laughs> <laughs> he's just a pure workhorse, isn't he? Like he, His workload in the in the Test Series so far, and he just keeps putting his hand up. He looks like someone who, who really likes getting into his work and – It'd be a real challenge for the captain to remove the ball from his hand. Oh, it is. You know, obviously, a his fitness is um, you know, at its peak. He's bowling really well. He's in great form, which obviously always helps. And um, the captain's got so much faith in him, and he's always that go-to man at the moment. And um, it'll be interesting to see how he bounces back in Sydney. Like he had such a massive workload um, over the last two tests, and um, it does start to take its toll. Like yeah, uh, because our guys. Without batting, probably not batting, firing as well as what we'd like. Um, the bowlers always have to kind of get back and have a bowl, and pretty much been bowling every day. So um, hopefully something can change up in Sydney because otherwise, like poor old Neil's going to run himself into the ground. Yeah, 
Yeah, and the the possible addition of Will Somerville, Will Somerville coming into the squad, that that could add another dimension to the New Zealand team coming into Sydney as well. Definitely, and it's probably like um, like you mentioned, Satna didn't bowl that well. He hasn't bowled well the last couple of tests, and um, and that's probably put a lot of pressure pressure back onto um, Kane Williamson to bowl the seamers a lot more. Where um, obviously, if your spinner was going well, he probably would take a good chunk of that workload um, off the seamers, but. Um, hopefully, if, if, with Will coming in and um, the track at Sydney filming it, a turning wicket like a bat, batsman's wicket, but starts to turn. So, hopefully, those guys start coming to, um, to the game a bit more and can relieve a bit of pressure off the um, seamers. Yeah, absolutely. And now, just back to your career, your best figures six for 54 against England back in 2002. Was, was that the best you felt? Bowling at international level? Oh yeah, it was it was a good day like that that getting the sixer against um, England and uh, we bowled well as a unit um, that game. We were still in a little bit the wicket, so myself and Andre Adams um, and a, another guy Chris Drum like um, had a bit of a day out against those guys, which is always nice. Um, but I probably felt better at other games like um, I played actually something up in India at Mahali and. Got a few wickets there, and that's the best I felt. It was tough work, um, but in terms of rhythm um, and where I wanted to put it on the, on a flat kind of slow wicket, that was probably the best I, I felt I bowled was um, in Mahali in India in 2002, I think it was. How do you mentally prepare to play in conditions that aren't conducive uh, to fast bowling? How, how do you, how do you how do you get yourself um, back to the top of your mark and just steaming in uh, with, without much assistance from the wicket? I think it's just once again, perseverance. I was kind of a bit like Neil Wagner, a bit more of the workhorse, and I had um, at various times Shane Bond um, bowling alongside me and um, Ian Butler, another young bowler. He bowled in the kind of mid-140, so my role was always to um, open. I was open to bowling, but once it starts swinging, it, it kind of, you know, to get some early wickets and then to uh, play a bit more of a um, containing role and um, then keep going and come back like, towards when we've got the second new ball. So, But then again, when you come back to New Zealand, it's a bit more senior friendly and conducive. So I was in the game a lot more when I was playing there. So my role changed um, from kind of at home to when I went overseas. Um, because obviously, in Dan Vittori, um, he was our, our best bowler and so we had a job to do to make sure that we got um, ourselves in a position where it would be best for Dan, how we could um, attack with uh, Daniel. Yeah, yep. So uh, more more just thinking about your role within the team and making sure you do your job well um, in the con- in the context of the situation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, and look, even like now, look, it always changes. It's like um, all of a sudden you're attacking and then there's a partnership gets starts formed and it doesn't matter whether you're at home or away and, then you play a bit more of a containing role, then you wait, then all of a sudden, bang, look, it happens, and then you're back, you're back attacking again. It's, um, it's a, that's test cricket at its finest. It's just like you, you attack for a while, and then you've got sometimes they, they push back, and you're a bit of a, and you're in a containing role. Um, or when you're batting, you're absorbing the pressure, like obviously we, we, have, we have done with, with the bat um, at the Boxing Day test, and then. All of a sudden, you come back out. The bowlers get tired. You start attacking again. So it's funny. Like um, that's the beauty of Test cricket. Um, over five days, it's a battle of attrition. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, opposite end of the spectrum, T Twenty cricket. You you were fortunate enough to play in that first ever T Twenty international back in two thousand and five, where. The players had the headbands, the moustaches, <laughs> uh, the, yeah. the, the the retro kits. Um, I think you might have bowled the first over of that game as well. Um, talk us through the fanfare there. At that time, did, did you actually think T20 cricket was going to be a thing or was it just a no, bit of fun? Not at all. It was just a big social kind of get-together. We got a huge crowd too, Eden Park. Obviously, any time you have Australia and New Zealand, as you've just seen the box day test, you know, do the Kiwi fans get up for it and to have, um, to play the first T20 international, it was played in a bit of a kind of festive kind of atmosphere and carnival atmosphere. I remember Michael Cuthbert bowling like Dennis Lilly and, <laughs> um, 
like when we grow is pretending to bowl underarm balls. That's right. Yeah. Some of our guys <laughs> had like um, like afros, moustaches, and like the old retro bre- uh, beige. Um, you can get in the um, kind of canary yellow uh, kit for the Aussies. It was funny. It was it was good, but like yeah, you can see where it's gone to now. Like it's um, amazing. Like T20 cricket and um, as a spectator of sport, like the BBL thing. And obviously the IPL has um, done wonders for that, and there's obviously T20. It's, in a way, it's probably forced a couple of guys to to choose whether they wanted to um, try and keep pushing for like test test honours, or whether to probably cut it short and head to T20 and do the T20 circuit. Um, so it's kind of divided um, a lot of the um, the players uh, in terms of which which way they want to go in terms of their careers. I think we've seen over the last kind of few years. And do you think it could be um, an opportunity as well for the likes of the Chris Greens of the world? They're getting exposure through 2020 cricket. Could that be a doorway for them into playing more regular first-class cricket, like a little bit like what we saw with Dave, David Warner in the early days? Definitely. Like, yeah, exactly. You saw David Warner when he first started. He played a bit of a glorified slogger um, when he first came and loved to hit the ball over the boundary, but he obviously turned himself into you know, a world-class test batter which probably you wouldn't have said he was going to be a test batter um, you know, in 2008, 2009 when, you first, when he first burst onto the scene. But, um, yeah, definitely like, yeah, like, like Chris Green and guys like that, it gives them opportunities. They go overseas, um, playing in different conditions, something that probably, unless you're playing test cricket or for your country, you never probably get to see, but it opens them up to playing in India, going over to the Caribbean, uh, over to England a lot. So, um I think P20 has been, been great. And obviously for the spectators, um, you know, you're, you're probably not sitting there for five days. You're, you're in there. You can take the kids down in the afternoon, watch the BBL game, uh, be entertained for uh, three hours and then kind of you know, catch the train home. And, um, you know, you've gone and seen you know, some world-class players for, for a few hours. Oh, it, it certainly, I know as a parent myself with kids, they love the atmosphere of the BBL games and – I think it is a very family-friendly option, uh, and I, I love Test cricket. I, I watch, I'd watch Test cricket eight days a week if it was possible. But certainly for new people to the game, and even for people like me that love Test cricket, the BBL's been outstanding and and something I love a lot. Oh, exactly. It, it just gets you kind of everyday kind of punter that doesn't really understand cricket and they've never really watched cricket because they probably see what the five-day test is. You know, pretty boring because I don't really understand you know, how it's played and what what's going on and who's winning. Someone always asks, "Fucking test cricket, oh, who's winning?" <laughs> like, well, like, well, no one really at the moment. Like, <laughs> even and then after five days, someone will go, "Oh, who won?" And you go, oh, no, it was draw. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, what? But and you get a T20 game and hey, you know, balls are flying into the crowd and like the kids are captivated because this. Stuff going on, you know, Matt's not walking around and there's things for kids going and going on and fireworks and so in that in that respect it's um it's done a great job in getting um your kind of everyday punter following cricket a bit more and, and then they start to watch a bit of test cricket after that and actually understand what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Now World Cups, three World Cup campaigns, um, all quite different for you, O three, O seven and two thousand eleven. Um, can you talk us through that experience of being at a World Cup and maybe how the different um, situations um, compared for you? Yes, yeah, so my first one was 03 in South Africa. Um, but yeah, uh, I came up a really good um, home summer. So we played um, like September, January against India. We'd, we'd played really well there. We'd beaten um, them. They were kind of nearly number one, number two team in the world, like with Australia and um, their batting lineup with Sessions and Dolphin, Drivers, Daywag, Ganguly. Um, we've done really well against those guys on kind of team of friendly wickets in New Zealand, but they didn't really adapt to that. And then, yeah, we headed across to, um, to South Africa and it was, it was, it was good. We, we played, we played okay without playing really well. Like we'd, um, we got ourselves to the kind of super, I think it was super six stage then. Yeah. And then we got knocked out by India, um, who, went on obviously to lose to Australia in the end, but um, yeah, I played a few 
a few games and then didn't play a few games. I've had a, like an average game against Sri Lanka and then you get dropped down and then all of a sudden someone else is doing well. Like Andre Adams came in for me and he was bowled really well, which was great. And he's got to wait for the opportunity again because it's one of those tournaments where you don't really change and you've seen it all. It's not you don't really change it. A winning combo. So yeah. I was kind of um, there, but that was that was that was that was great. Um, we beat South Africa and knocked them out. Of the um, uh, then we got a hundred there and we knocked them out at uh, the Wanderers. So that was um, great. I watched Shane Bond bowl one of the best bowls I've ever seen against the world class Australian side. He got six for twenty eight. That's think, right. Yeah. Um, at uh, Port Elizabeth, it was just a mate. But then, way well, hey, Michael Bevan and. Um, Andy Bickle got stuck, stuck in and they got you to 200 and then <laughs> Brett Lee came and bowled us out. So <laughs> that was that was disappointing losing that one because Shane, had, that was the best spell of bowling of the tournament, really. Um, oh, when he was then, at the peak of his powers, he was incredible oh, to watch Shane Bond. Unbelievable. I was 12th man, so I was running drinks there like every kind of over that he's bowling. <laughs> he'd just get another wicket and then he'd get another one. And he, he was like getting ponting. Langer, oh sorry, Hayden, um, Gilchrist, Damien Martin, like they're all like look, these world class players he's getting out. So um, then, yeah, so then we kind of bowed out there and then we went into the 07 World Cup, which is in the West Indies. Um, once again, I was, probably, I was in the kind of, I wasn't in the first team pick at, at that stage. I'd just come back from injury and um, played quite well domestically and got called in um, into the squad there. and then I got injured against Canada and I had to fly home after a couple of games. Um, we bowed out there in the semi final against Sri Lanka, who went on to lose uh, once again to Australia in yep. that one. Um, and then I went over as an injury replacement in 2011 to India. And I was only there for the back end of that. So I was there yep. for, um, we lost, we lost in the semi to Sri Lanka again, um, in Sri Lanka, but. I was only there for a couple of games, and um, yeah, didn't feature that one. So that was kind of that was kind of it. Actually, that was my last um, international um, uh, tour. Uh, here in yeah, and then you come to Australia to play club cricket. Can you tell us a bit of the story about uh, your connection with Australia? I understand you met your wife in India. Is that right? Is she is she yeah. your connection to Australia? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd originally prior to meeting her, so I met her in 07, 08 when I went to the ICL tournament in India. She was a TV presenter. She's been she working for a TV, TV company that owns okay. um, the right to, um, to the um, tournament. So I met her there, and um, but she lives in Melbourne. I was in Auckland. Um, but prior to that, um, Steve Rickson, was the uh, coach of New Zealand, obviously played here in Australia. Yeah. For Australia. And um, he um, he asked me one day, he said, oh, would you like to go back and play a pre-season a couple of months for my club team, Sutherland, which is up in Sydney. And this is an O2. Yep. Yeah, no worries. I was, the, uh, the New Zealand Warriors made the grand final in rugby league that year. So I was That's always right. going to watch that. They played, they lost to uh, Sydney Roosters. And um, I just, yeah, took my cricket gear with me and, um, Stay there and went back a couple, couple more times to Sutherland and Steve Smith came through there. Um, played with him at Sutherland for a, for a season. Uh, also played with Glenn McGrath for a game, which was great. He wow. He played for Sutherland. Uh, Stewie Clark, um, Phil Jake. So yep. we had a, we had, um, yeah, some you know, really good players um, play for us. Uh, Adam Zampa played and um, uh, Nick Maddinson. So there's some... Yeah, quality players have gone through Sutherland. And then, then I, and in 2013, when I was still living in New Zealand, I, was, um, uh, came, I went over and played for uh, Bankstown. And I played three years for Bankstown when I first moved to Australia in 2013. Ah, right. Um, so Bill Jake played for Sutherland that year, and he was deemed the overseas player as he um, gave up residency because he was playing in England at the time. Right. Oh, there so, you go. So there's only... So you can't play two, you couldn't play two overseas players at the same time. You can't play one, but still, was, that, that season was the um, overseas. So I went and um, just found another club and a good, my best friend plays for Bankstown. He said, mate, come play there. And 
that's yeah. So I've been lucky enough to play for two fantastic clubs in Sydney, with Sutherland and uh, also Bankstown. And, and your wife has links to a, a, a Chuka. Is she an Chuka girl originally? Yep. Yeah, she's originally from Chuka. So her parents, um, yeah, were down in Chuka, and um, yeah, when we moved down to Albury, which was in 2017, um, I bought some love. Father in law passed away, and subsequently, my, my father in law's moved from Echuca up to Albury with us as well, so he's not too far away. So he's closer to um, to us, and that was the reason why we moved out of Sydney, um, was to okay. be kind of closer to um, to my wife's parents and family, which are all down this, uh, down this way in Albury and uh, the surrounding area. And, and you've still got a connection to cricket, uh. Premiership winner at the Lavington Panthers under Robbie McKinlay's coaching. I <laughs> hear. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was. Well, when we first moved down in 2017, um, I was coming down to have a look at a uh, house. It must have been there in July. And um, one of my good friends, Ian Butler, who I played international cricket with um, yep. up in Sydney, he's got one of his uh, workers who um, does a lot of coaching with him, Ross Porson, and he he's from Albury. And funny enough, he was in the car when I was on my down and said. Uh, Oh, I'm from Albury. If you ever want to go and play cricket down there, I'll put you in touch with um, our coach, Robbie McKinley. But, please, geez, within 12 hours, Robbie McKinley hit me up. <laughs> hit me up whether I'm going to um, play a full season for the thing. And he's going to take me on a tour and everything around, um, take me around Lavington and give me the old, uh, yeah, just you know, lay it on for me. So, but, <laughs> um, but once again, I'm glad I've gone to a really good club. Um, they were great when we first moved down. Um, obviously, I didn't know anyone really down here other than my brother-in-law and a few family members. So um, probably the easiest way to make friends um, is to play sport. And so I went and played for Lamington, won the premiership that year with, with them. Um, we, we all played pretty well that year. And, and uh, yeah, and then played a bit of, bit of football because it's all AFL down here. Yeah. So I played... Um, Mate, we went in Rome, uh, I <laughs> threw some boots on and played um, like, uh, reserved footy down here for um, a thing called Holbrook, yeah, which Hol- is Robbie McKinley's um, yeah, old stomping ground. Uh, excellent. And and I hear I hear you play a bit of baseball as well, and you do a bit of um, bit of the, the baseball. Oh, I love the baseball. Like, um, it probably keeps me connected to a lot of guys back home because we all love baseball, like Shane Bond, Jacob Warren, Danny Vittori. Uh, Peter Fulton, who's the current batting coach um, at the moment. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, Scott Zorris, there was a lot of us like, that played um, international cricket uh, that we love our baseball. And so we all play fantasy baseball, a bit like that, Super League, um, on a um, stuff that you had with football. And kind of keeps me involved, but I played a bit of um, baseball up here and, um, and up back up in Sydney. But I really enjoy baseball. It's um, a nice little outlet. Um, it's probably not as taxing as bowling. Like, you know, it's cricket. <laughs> it doesn't take as long. And you, you mentioned a couple of your former teammates, uh, some of them doing really good things at the moment. Andre Adams uh, at Cricket New South Wales, a lot of talk around him and the work he's been doing with uh, Mitchell Stark in particular and Bondi, of course, coaching the Sydney Thunder. How, how good is it that, that these blokes are – are still involved and in, in making a big difference in, in cricket, or albeit um, sort of for the enemy uh, from your point of view, from a from a New Zealand point of view. Do you still keep in touch with those guys? Yeah, definitely. I saw Andre about probably no less than probably a month or so ago. Um, went back to Sydney and I catch up with him as, as much as I can. Same with Shane Bond. I went, I went there and I met him at one of the games when they were playing the Renegades in Melbourne, which is obviously a little bit closer than going back to Sydney now, but um, no, we keep in touch um, and see how everything's going. I think he's done a great job. And I know a couple of the young guys playing for the Thunder and, that are alongside um, Shane, and they really love Shane, um, what he's doing. And I think coaching nowadays, it doesn't matter what like, said, the enemy. Like, we've had a lot of Australian coaches go across to New Zealand and coaching in first class cricket. And we've actually got an Australian as our bowling coach at the moment and then the international team, Shane Jurgensen, who I had as my bowling coach. Uh, when I was playing for the Black Caps as well, so and he's brilliant, and he's uh, a you know Queensland lad, and um, I think you're, you're finding now that Graham Hicks 
Zimbabwe and England player is the batting advisor in the Australian team. Like coaching is purely professional. Like if you if you're good enough, you, you're going wherever you, you can go and get gigs. And, and do you think the T Twenty leagues have helped with that as well? We see a lot of uh, the interaction between the international players now. It seems to be a, a global cricket community where there are guys learning from each other in all the different franchises around the world. Oh, for sure. Like, you, did, you never really used to like um, sort of hang out with a lot of the opposition. Like when you played back in kind of the early two thousands, when I was still, when I was playing, um, it wasn't until kind of that late two thousand period where the IPL and like started, where you're actually playing with a couple of Aussies, a South African, a Pakistani, or a cut sure Sri Lankan, and so you're getting to know like a lot of different players. I think it's broken quite a few barriers down, like because. All of a sudden, in test three years, think, oh, I'm playing at such and such. And, oh, he's a bit of an idiot. But then all of a sudden, you're actually playing with him like a month later in, <laughs> in, the, in the IPL. You go, oh, he's actually a really good dude. Uh, yeah. So it kind of, um, and then, then you just suck up new friendships. And, um, and yeah, I was lucky enough to play like, for Auckland and for a few different franchises and, and play alongside and meet international players. And you, you pick out so much, like, um, Stuff off those guys and the way they do things, and um, that can yeah, kind of pick out and hopefully help your game. And just lastly, um, transitioning from being a professional athlete uh, back to being a, a more normal citizen, for want of a better t- better term, how have you found that the transition out of out of being full time professional, um, and then and then adjusting into life. Uh, what's what's life like for you now, and um, what are you looking forward to in the future? Well, I kind of transitioned. Mine was like our first transition out of cricket. I've basically been doing cricket since I was 17. Um, hadn't had a, basically, like what you better term, like a, a proper job, like a uh, you know, nine to five type job. Um, cricket was that. But then I started getting injuries on my my arm started playing up my shoulder and, and I could have jumped out. But I was lucky enough to um, to have met a couple of uh, guys that loved their cricket. They were very successful businessmen and they got me on board with a, um, a craft beer company back in New Zealand called Moa. And yeah. um, so, like, a, yeah, and um, was working with them back on, like, I was on the bottom tier, like, a, back down the bottom, got to work your way up again, which is, I didn't mind, it was quite humbling. Yeah. Um, and, um, which I think some guys fear is actually but playing cricket, they're comfortable. Um, it's actually taking that step backwards. Yeah. Try and go a couple of steps forward again. And, but I, I, I embraced that, um, and started working my way up, um, the company in that way. And it took me to Australia. It brought me to here. That's what brought us here. Was I had a, um, opportunity to, um, run the Australian arm of, um, Moa. Wow. Uh, based out of Sydney. So, I took up that. That's why we did me originally, um, and the cricket was just was secondary. Yeah. Um, so that was good. So then, um, but it was time to move on, and I've always been into. Um, I'm actually doing a building apprenticeship at the moment, mature age um, building apprenticeship. Um, I've always been keen on. Um, my father was a builder, and we've renoed a couple of house, you know, a couple of houses during our time, and um, I've always had the passion for being on tools. So. I actually left Moa and um, jumped into TAFE. So I was kind of the last year or so I've been at TAFE with um, you know, a bunch of 17, 18 year olds um, back again. And um, once again, back on the bottom rung, um, working my way up, um, yeah, trying to get my builder's license. So that's where I, that's, that, that's the future for me now. Is, um, and my wife um, has just started an interior design business, um, which is going well. She has property side with, um, Another one of our work colleagues, and so it's going to complement what we do quite nicely. Because my wife's been an interior designer, and, and um, myself with um, a construction background. Yeah, that sounds like a, a perfect fit, really. Having the um, <laughs> you you build them, and she makes them look good on the inside. <laughs> exactly. So that's that. Hopefully, that's the plan. And I've got a couple of years left um, uh, until I get my my trade ticket, and um, but I'm, I'm learning. You know, lots on the way and I think probably being 41 and I know exactly what I want to do so I kind of just I get things done like I need to a taste and I kind of watch through the young guys and, um, and girls like there's a couple of females in there and you know 
at 17 and 18, they probably don't really know exactly what they want to do yet. And, but um, probably as a mature age, you know, time's gone on my side. I need to kind of get in there and get things done and kind of move forward. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like the right attitude to have. I'm 41 myself and I've changed changed jobs a few times over the years and it, it's good to have a goal that you're working towards and at our age I guess you know what you want and you're willing to do what it takes to get there and, and that's, a, that's a great attitude to have. Now, final, final question. Uh, this, is, this is a new one for the podcast and um, – I'm I'm dropping the, this on you unprompted, but I'll, we'll see how we go. Um, the the usual question people ask is around if you could have dinner with anyone um, living or dead, who would you invite to dinner? If you could have three people, but I, I want to put a bit of a cricket spin on this. If you could have a net with anyone uh, living or dead, uh, cricketer, celebrity, whoever, um, who would your top three be to have a net with? Oh. Uh- Probably Viv Richards would be one of them. He was always my boyhood hero. I'd grown up. I always used to love the West Indies, so he was always one. I'd managed to have a couple of beers on a few occasions when he was coach of the West Indies um, oh, when wow. I was playing. But he was uh, he was always one I looked up to um, when I was um, playing with that a bit of arrogant swagger about him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so nah, he would, he'd be one. Another one, um, I don't know. I've played with him in India when I was playing. It was Matthew Elliott. Yep. I, I used to love Matthew Elliott when, once again, like um, in backyard cricket on back in the late 90s, he was just smashing it for Australia. And I, I used to think, geez, this guy, he wears this helmet with the little air guards and <laughs> just pulls and cuts everything and smashes it. I said, I used to love him. So they, once again, I played with him and yeah, I, I love him. He's a great bloke, um, Matthew Elliott. So he'd be, one, he'd be another one. And I think, and Maybe number three, I'm, geez. I'm just trying to think. Number three. Um, Anyone you'd like to tonk around a bit? Any a, 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 any bowler you fancied? No, it wasn't too many bowls. I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just sit there and smack it. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a few batters that thought the same to me. They thought, oh, geez, we love that. We'll smack him around a bit. <laughs> um, no, probably um, if anything, one of the one of the other greats I used to love watching him playing was um, Brian Lara. Like um, he was one of the best, like I have ever bowled to. Um, and watching him get a two seven seven, I've got it on video on VHS. Oh, it's I was solid. I was at the SCG when he got his two seven seven. Actually, uh, unbelievable! I've got that. I used to watch that over and over and over again at two seven seven, and like well, she. Had Greg back in his bowling and yeah. Craig McDermott, he's just wearing a fucking like baseball cap and just pulling them and because he eventually yeah, got awesome. run out, didn't he? He didn't, yeah. The, yeah, he didn't get dismissed by the bowlers. He just he looked like <laughs> he, he would have batted for days. Oh, he's just pumping it. But yeah, he'd be another one. Like just um, yeah, if I could have a net, like um, bowling him. So funny enough, he was one I actually went down and had a net. I was playing first class cricket and they um. The guy said, oh, we need some net bowlers to get out and to the Western East that were touring yeah. um, at the time. I said, I'll go. I said, I may <laughs> need to get a bowl. I said, I may need to get the bowl to point Brian Lara and, and Carl Hooper and guys like that. So I said, I'll, I'll go down. Because everyone thought, no, nah, no, nah, who wants to get out and bowl down on it? <laughs> Mate, had a great time. I thought, geez, just watching them play and, and that, you know, he bowled a couple of bounces and they kind of stuck and weave a couple and they, yep. Yeah. It was, it was great. It was, it was, that was a fantastic experience, that one. Oh, that's absolutely outstanding. Well, it's been an absolute pre- pleasure chatting to you, Daryl. Um, thank you so much for your time and all the best um, with life going forward with your apprenticeship and, and life as a dad and, and a husband. Um, thanks for joining us on the Cricket Library podcast. Beautiful, mate. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me. A massive thank you to Daryl Tuffy for giving us his time on the Cricket Library podcast for our final episode for 2019. And of course, if you've missed anything in the year that has been, head to your favourite podcast provider. You know where to go. You might want to go to Spotify. You might want to go to iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Podbean, wherever you like. Today's Tales another great option. You'll also find some of my written work there 
at the Today's Tale website. So please do that. Please make sure you like, subscribe, share, tweet, do whatever you need to do to get the word out there about the Cricket Library podcast. It is very much appreciated and great to have a guest like Daryl Tuffy to finish the year. Fantastic to hear about the ins and outs of playing international cricket. Loved his net selections for his three people he'd like to net with. Richards, Elliot, Lara. My word, that would be a very interesting net session and one I'd probably like to gate crash. I'd probably like to send down a few leggies and I'm sure my step count would be pretty high that day because I'd be chasing leather uh, quite regularly, bowling to the calibre of players like that. Uh, Also really loved the way that that Daryl's transitioned out of cricket, really taken it upon himself to get himself... Uh, a future, put himself in a position where he can uh, learn some new skills and and become the person that he aspires to be and uh, really commendable the way that he's gone about his business since retiring from international cricket. Uh, a, a real credit to him and um, great to hear about that part of his journey as well. So have yourselves a great 2020 everyone. The Cricket Library podcast will be back bigger and better next year and we look forward to bringing you more great guests like Daryl Tuffy from Matt Ellis it is bye for now